tonight. Our program, as all of you know, is on ISIS and the global reach of Islamist extremism. Um, a lot of people talk about and worry about the immediate threat, but there also is a long-term uh, perspective in this. Uh, our guest has, uh, is a graduate of Yale. Uh, his uh, undergraduate degree was in uh, the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, uh, the studies of that area. His PhD uh, was in Russian and Soviet military history, also from, from Yale. He taught for a decade at the United States Military Academy at, at West Point. Uh, the basic course, which I think every cadet still has to take on, on military art and history, and then also grand strategy, revolutionary warfare, and diplomatic history. Um, he, in a, following that, and by the way, during that period, he co-authored a book with his father on uh, uh, the need to uh, overcome uh, American military weakness and build up American forces. That was 2000. His father is a, a professor of history at uh, Yale, classical studies, Peloponnesian War Specialist, Hudson Institute Research Fellow. And, uh, so his father is well known in the nation. And uh, our, our guest has been immersed in a very serious intellectual environment from a very early age. So the things we're talking about tonight have at least 25 years of serious reflection uh, on his part, uh, which has uh, uh, grown into a number of books that he's written and a number of, of very interesting policy uh, 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 encouragements. Uh, he uh, was an advocate of the surge in Iraq. Uh, he uh, is a, an associate, I can say, with General Petra Petraeus. And uh, uh, Mc McChrystal, I believe, introduced him originally to the, the ball game. And uh, in any case, the advocacy of the surge was a very important part. He's known as one of the four major architects of that surge policy. And as some of you recall, he spoke here uh, in 2007, in mid-year, on uh, the, the, ultra, the most urgent question of the moment, will the surge work? And we, we remember that uh, well, and uh, liked the, the presentation very much, of course. The, uh, he's written on other subjects. Let me quickly say he's uh, written on uh, a number of areas of, the, of military and strategic considerations, but he's uh, co-authored a book with his colleague, Thomas Donalds, Donnelly, uh, one on, on uh, the future of land war. And in a smaller article, he refers to uh, conventional warfare and unconventional times, something like that. But anyway, that's a, obviously a major question, the future of land warfare. And then he also uh, co-edited a book with Thomas Donnelly on uh, the uh, various approaches that one might take over the long haul, the long view of this struggle. Uh, so as I said, he's a gentleman who's devoted years of study to these matters, lots of reflection, and it's an enormous privilege for us to have him join us this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure, uh, indeed, to introduce Dr. Fred Kagan. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, thank you for inviting me back. Um, thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. <clears throat> um, let me start by making uh, the requisite apology. I seem to be getting over a flu, which is a testament to the efficacy of this year's flu vaccine. Um, so apologies in advance if I uh, make odd noises sound stranger than I might otherwise or, or, or so forth. And if I misspeak in any way, then it's because of the flu. <laughs> We'll establish that um, uh, up front. So I, I am from Washington. It's not my fault. <laughs> Actually, when, when, when my wife and I um, would go around to uh, visit military units in the field, as we uh, spent a fair amount of time doing, um, it, became a, it did become sort of a joke to come in and say, hi, we're from Washington. We're here to help. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's lovely to be back here in, uh, in Baltimore. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, I hope you drank heavily. 
Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have um, very much in the way of, of good cheer to offer you, but I'm glad that you're all here. Um, I'm glad that you're interested in this topic, and I'll do my best to uh, make it worth your while briefly, um, and then try to get into questions uh, as quickly as I can. So the position that I'm in now is uh, at, as uh, director of something that we call the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute, um, which is uh, basically an open source intelligence organization. And by that I mean that we spend our time collecting uh, publicly available information on Al-Qaeda and also on Iran and conducting analysis of it um, in a way that's very similar to the way that the intelligence community uh, conducts analysis on classified information. Um, and produce situation reports of what's going on. So I am immersed in the day-to-day -day, uh, misery of what's going on, and I want to talk to you about that. And I hope you'll stay with me on the subject of what's going on and not leap too quickly to what should we do about it. Um, I am normally someone who uh, really does not approve of admiring the problem. And I'm normally uh, very eager to say, okay, that's, that's great, you know, what do we do? Um, but at this stage in, in history, actually, I think it's important to make sure that we understand the problem. And in many respects, particularly because the question of what should we do about it has become so uh, acrimonious, um, and because the answers are extremely unpleasant, I have to say, um, at least as far as I can see them. I think that it's important that we start by coming together to agree on what the problem actually is. Because I think there's very little chance that we as a nation are going to decide anything intelligent about what to do about it if we can't agree on what it is. So I'll talk with you about uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and its affiliates as I see it. Um, I'm also happy to talk to you about uh, Iran, which plays an important role in this. The nuclear program, of course, we can talk about doesn't really play into the Al-Qaeda equation yet. Um, but Iran uh, is playing a very important role in fueling uh, the sectarian war in the Middle East that is... Uh, driving the expansion of Al-Qaeda. So <clears throat> there's a lot of mythology about what Al-Qaeda actually is or was. And let me just lay out for you my view. It is an organization that was founded by Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Um, it immediately after the Soviets withdrew, uh, it did uh, begin to metastasize right away. Um, Bin Laden retained uh, safe havens in Afghanistan and built training camps in the mid-90s, but he also uh, decamped to Sudan for a time and began laying the basis of an Africa network uh, that was a priority for him. Uh, they began establishing their or deepening roots in Pakistan and so forth. And throughout the 90s, the group continued to work on extending its reach. And we had al-Qaeda uh, groups, affiliates as it were, that were not formally named as distinct groups at the time in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen. Um, and by 2002, we had uh, Ayman al, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, uh, the founder of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, who was not at the time affiliated with Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, so it's important to understand that this movement didn't start to metastasize when we invaded Afghanistan or Iraq. That's one of the myths that's out there, is that we sort of hit them and they splattered all over the place. That's actually not the case. Uh, there are very few Al-Qaeda franchises now that don't have uh, precursors in the 90s in conscious attempts that bin Laden and, and his guys were making to establish a global footprint, because it, was always, it always had a global objective. Uh, its objective was always to unite the Muslim community, the Ummah, um, under its banner of the righteous, in their minds, uh, view of Islam, uh, and to destroy uh, the forces of darkness, by which they meant us, um, that were luring virtuous Muslims away from the faith. And that was always the core of the bin Laden creed, uh, and it was always the basis of the organization and efforts that Al-Qaeda undertook. So, <clears throat> 2001 occurred. I was just walking around the beautiful memorial uh, to the victims of 9-11 out front. Um, I was teaching uh, at West Point at the time. 
uh, when the planes hit and one of my favorite cadets came running up to me and said, sir, they just attacked the World Trade Center. I ran in, we watched it. It was in actually, I think it was a grand strategy class. Um, and spent some time watching the, uh, the buildings burn and then tried to turn back to our studies. Um, and I was very grateful that I was there where at least I could feel as if I might make some positive contribution to defending our nation, and at least by trying to train the people who would actually put their lives on their line. Little did I know at the time uh, that it would be 13 years later uh, and we would continue to be at war. And the cadets that I taught uh, who entered the force as second lieutenants, fearful that the war would be over before they got there. And to my credit, I did always tell them, don't worry, there's going to be plenty of war for you. <laughs> they never believed me. Um, now I have majors and lieutenant colonels whom I taught who have served multiple times. I've been fortunate enough not to uh, lose any that I was very close to. Um, but I have nerve endings, as it were, as anyone who uh, taught at West Point in that period has throughout the world now combating this organization. And it isn't going well. The most success that we ever had was in Afghanistan. And in 2002, we did drive Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. And if you would like a historical reflection on why it didn't end there, I'm happy to provide some thoughts on that. But needless to say, it didn't. Um, instead of destroying Al-Qaeda, we largely pushed it into Pakistan. And it then um, focused on metastasizing uh, much more aggressively than it had before. Um, we kept al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan largely until very recently um, and it was one of the few, it was really the only place where you could actually point to American counterterrorism strategy and say that was successful in the sense that we drove them out and we, working with our Afghan partners, kept them out. Now they're returning as our forces draw down um, and this is becoming a concern again. We may well lose in that theater uh, where we were winning uh, and by lose I mean uh, fail in our overarching mission to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a safe haven for Al-Qaeda once more. Um, needless to say, if, as anyone who's read any newspaper in the last 10 years knows, Pakistan became a very hospitable environment for them. Uh, it continues to be far too hospitable an environment for them. And you have what the administration likes to refer to as Al-Qaeda core or Al-Qaeda senior leadership uh, around the person of Ayman al-Zawahiri who replaced bin Laden uh, after we killed him. Uh, is in Pakistan, I presume, living an equally luxurious life uh, to the one that uh, his predecessor lived. Um, but it's always been a bit of a misnomer to talk about that as Al-Qaeda core. And it's also always been a bit of a misnomer to talk about it as Al-Qaeda senior leadership. Because the truth is that the thing that defines the core leader group in Al-Qaeda is shared experience in combat. Anyone who's been in combat knows that. But if you think back to any crucible experience in your life and the bonds and friendships and trust relationships that you formed, that's what it was like for these guys when they were fighting the Soviets. It's what it was like for these guys in the 90s. It was, it's what it was like for these guys fighting us. And so we can watch generations of human networks that are built around crucible experiences, all aimed, all fundamentally uh, around fighting us, except for the first one. And those are the leader teams. They're not all in Pakistan. So the number, the effective number two in Al-Qaeda is a guy named Wahishi, Nasir al-Wahishi, uh, who is actually the leader of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is the Al-Qaeda franchise in Yemen. He is simultaneously the Al-Qaeda number two. He's always been in Yemen. I mean, he fought in Afghanistan in the 90s, uh, in the 80s, but he is uh, Yemeni. He's been in Yemen. He, hasn't, he wasn't sent there to take over. He is a part of the core leader team. He's part of Al-Qaeda core. He's part of Al-Qaeda senior leadership, and yet he's in Yemen. And that's what makes it problematic, in my view, to have defined the problem originally as this administration, and to some extent its predecessor did, as being a core Al-Qaeda that's in the tribal areas of Pakistan, because that was actually never true. It was always more of a problem than that. Um, now, the Yemen franchise is doing uh, disturbingly well, not through any particular merit of its own, but because Yemen is collapsing. And you may have uh, heard the president say a couple of times that Yemen was the model of our uh, terrorism strategy. I sure hope it ain't. 
uh, I sure hope that's not true because it's not going well. Yemen actually has fallen apart effectively. An Iranian-backed uh, insurgency from the north of the country called the Al-Houthi movement uh, actually seized the capital Sana'a uh, some months ago, forced itself into power, um, and is driving toward um, some kind of partition of the country along previous lines along which it had been riven. Needless to say, this is attracting the attention of the Yemeni government such as it is, and the Yemeni military such as it is, and is distracting them from taking the fight to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is leaving that group uh, breathing space. And there are significant parts of Yemen that are, let me say, particularly more ungoverned than they usually are, Yemen not being a place known historically for a huge amount of governance. Um, and you have very serious al-Qaeda sanctuaries there. Um, our strategy, such as it is, of doing these periodic uh, senior leader kill shots has been completely ineffective um, at degrading the al-Qaeda organization in Yemen as a fighting organization. Um, I don't want to overstate it. It's not in great shape because globally it's sort of an economy of force for al-Qaeda. It's not their main effort at this point. Um, right now, obviously, they are fixated on the problem in Iraq and Syria, just as a lot of other people are, or at least were until the tragedy in Sydney uh, that ended today, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so how are things going for al-Qaeda in Iraq? Well, it's rather complicated. Um, on the one hand, the good news, if you're Ayman al-Zawahiri reading the, reading the reports and wanting to feel happy about things, our boy's done good. We've got an al-Qaeda franchise, al-Qaeda in Iraq, which rebranded itself, the Islamic State of Iraq, and al-Sham, which kind of aggravated us, and we got into a fight with these guys, and we think Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is, is kind of a megalomaniacal jerk and a bit too violent, and of course that says something when the al-Qaeda senior leadership thinks that you're a bit too violent. <laughs> um, that's, that's, not a good, that's not a good thing for us. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, what's gone on? Well, what's gone on is Baghdadi has raised an army um, of several tens of thousands um, that is equipped with uh, what those familiar with the Northern Ir with the Iron Irish troubles would call technicals, um, in the sense that they are, you know, largely um, pickup trucks and other things with mounted crew-served weapons on them, heavy machine guns and mortars and things. They do have some armor. Um, they do have some Soviet-era armor that was looted from Syria or taken from the Iraqis. I don't think they're actually driving M1s around. I don't think they actually got any of those from us or from the depots we left behind. They are using our howitzers, I believe, um, from the Iraqi military bases they overran. Um, and, of course, they've seized a large swath of territory in Iraq, including Iraq's second largest city of Mosul, which they still control. Um, all of that is happy news for Zawahiri. Uh, the problem is that Baghdadi uh, and Zawahiri basically split. Um, and you have this odd schism within the movement, which has become a real distraction to policymakers. So let me try to help um, by giving you a bottom line up front on that. From our standpoint, it doesn't matter one bit. It's irrelevant to us. Because the ideology that Baghdadi is, uh, subscribes to is exactly the same as the ideology that Zawahiri subscribes to. They have disagreements about timing and pacing and basically fundamentally about whom to kill when. That's basically what the argument between them is about. Um, but it's not as if Baghdadi it rejects in any way the global ambitions of al-Qaeda writ large or the intention to attack the far enemy, which would be us or any such things. Um, it really is a tactical and largely also personality driven. Um, if this weren't being filmed, I would give you the, the word that I actually would use for Baghdadi. Let's just say he's not a pleasant guy. Um, so that's good news, bad news for Zawahiri. For us, it's all bad. How many of you remember, this is drilled into my head because I watched it so many times. It was like a lending tree commercial that, that ended. The tagline was, when banks compete, you win. Remember that? <laughs> Well, let me t when terrorist organizations compete, we lose. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the situation that we're actually in right now. Because you have uh, the artist formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, now styling itself the Islamic State, um, competing fundamentally with the mothership, with Al-Qaeda, uh, to be the biggest, baddest, nastiest terrorist actor that anyone has had to control the most terrain, which it already does. 
uh, to be the wealthiest, which mm, it may be, although its expenses are a lot higher because it's trying to govern, to be the most successful, and of course to be the most brutal. Now, <clears throat> the core of the fight between Baghdadi and Zawahiri emerged when Baghdadi, in a typical megalomaniacal fashion, claimed to be responsible not only for the Al-Qaeda franchise in Iraq, but also for the one in Syria. And that was a problem because the Al-Qaeda franchise in Syria, which is a different group entirely, um, was playing a much more intelligent hand than uh, Baghdadi was. The leader of that organization is a fellow named Jolani. Um, usually these guys' names tell you either where they actually are from or where they would like you to think they're from. Um, in this case, Jelani tells you he actually is from the Golan Heights, from the Syrian part, um, and he's an extremely smart fellow. And he is the leader of the organization known as Jabhat al-Nusra, which stands for the sort of support front or the auxiliary front. And he left Mosul in 2011 as the Arab Spring was kicking off um, in Syria with seven brothers. And they went there and founded this organization. They had a lot to build on, mind you, because as we had been saying all along, uh, Assad had been first permitting and then supporting a flow of al-Qaeda and Iraq fighters through Syria into Iraq. And I remember many conversations in 2006, 2007, and so forth as we were talking about this and saying this is going to bite him. Well, it did. Um, unfortunately, we can't really take any joy in that because it bites us too. So you have two al-Qaeda franchises operating in Syria, and they're not getting along very well. Now, ISIS has not been doing terribly well in Syria. Well, that's not fair. It was, it was on a roll for a while. Then things got a little dicey. Now it's kind of reconstituting. It's engaged in a multi-front war. It's fighting the Assad regime. It's fighting Jabhat al-Nusra. It's fighting other elements of the moderate opposition, such as it is. Um, and of course, it's fighting to control its core power base, which means also fighting to suppress insurgency there. Um, that's a lot of fighting to do, but it's actually managing and it's extending its reach in Syria on the whole rather than uh, contracting. But it's not the most worrisome group in Syria. I actually think Jabhat al-Nusra is more dangerous. The difference in approach between Jelani and Baghdadi was that Jelani, up until the point when Baghdadi said, I'm in charge here, uh, Jelani had not been acknowledging his relationship to al-Qaeda. He had been posturing himself as a Syrian nationalist fighting against the Assad regime, which sold well in Syria, which especially at the time was not yet really radicalized to the point where there was a lot of enthusiasm for al-Qaeda ideology. And in fact, it was regarded as a problem for Jelani that he was forced either to disavow his relationship with al-Qaeda or to avow it publicly and thereby say to the Syrian people, actually, I'm not a nationalist, I'm an internationalist, and I'm part of this global movement that believes a whole bunch of stuff that you probably don't. That was one of the reasons why he was pissed off with Baghdadi and why Zawahiri was unhappy with him, because he forced Jelani to make that choice. Now, attend carefully. Jelani still had a choice at that moment. He could have repudiated his relationship with al-Qaeda. He could have hedged. He could have said, well, you know, I'm a radical Islamist and so forth, but in a good way. Um, <laughs> but I not, I, I'm a nationalist, fundamentally. I'm a Syrian nationalist. I don't subscribe to this, this global stuff. You know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And there are other Syrian groups that are now playing with him very closely that, that still take that position. And they say, we're not internationalists. We're just radical uh, Islamist Syrian nationalists. He could have done that. He didn't. That's very important because you'll hear a lot, to the extent that you hear anything about this these days, <clears throat> in the media about how we don't have to worry about Jabhat al-Nusra because it's locally focused, because it's only fighting in Syria, it's not trying to kill us now, which actually isn't true. But I want you to keep in your mind the fact that Jelani was faced with a simple choice to make of whether he was going to continue to adhere to the internationalist position of the global al-Qaeda movement or whether he was going to adopt a nationalist Islamist view because that was actually the only point of disagreement and he chose to avow the internationalist creed. That's pretty interesting. Now he's been very clever in a lot of other ways and so whereas ISIS in Iraq has built up its own armies as I said, has its own mechanized forces and so forth, Jabhat al-Nusra 
has interwoven itself with the opposition. It doesn't, on the whole, have its own military forces that operate as distinct units the way most of the other Syrian opposition groups do. Instead, it describes itself as having a uh, special forces kind of capability that it adds to other groups, and it moves around the country supporting different groups. There's an excellent paper coming out on this, by the way, from uh, the Institute for the Study of War, which my wife uh, founded in 2007 also, um, should be coming out this week, uh, laying out Jabhat al-Nusra in, in all of its glorious detail. Um, and it's very worrisome. And it's governing. And that's the other thing that's worrisome about both of these organizations. Jabhat al-Nusra doesn't set up its own governorates and pretend and say that it has a government, but it is in fact performing the services of government uh, in a basic way with Sharia courts, but also with service provision and uh, dispute adjudication and various other things. ISIS has established a formal governing structure and has declared a number of what it calls wilayets, um, basically provinces. Will a wilayet is the, is the Ottoman term for uh, a province. Iraq used to consist of three wilayets uh, in Ottoman times. So there are now wilayets all around uh, Iraq, but more disturbingly, recently Baghdadi recognized formally five new wilayets outside of Iraq. Um, one of them he recognized is in Saudi Arabia, and I'm rather skeptical that there's actually a wilayet there, although I think the Saudis have a radicalization problem within their military that's very worrisome. One of them is in Yemen, which I think is really a non-starter because the Al-Qaeda group in Yemen has remained very loyal to Zawahiri and uh, is certainly not supporting an ISIS uh, wilayet there. But the other three are of concern. Um, they claim to have one in Algeria. Again, I'm a little doubtful of that. The Algerians have a pretty strong record of, of crushing people who try to do this kind of thing. They claim to have one in Tunisia, which is more credible. Uh, they have cells operating in Morocco, although I don't think they have a wilayet there. But the last two really are real. One is in Sinai, where the Al-Qaeda group Ansar Bayt al-Maqdis swore fealty to ISIS and has been recognized in turn as having a wilayet. Now, I, this is not a main focus for us uh, to look at Sinai, and it's virtually impossible, well, let me not say that, it's very hard from open sources and probably even from classified sources to get a real feel for how strong that organization is because everyone who would know anything about it has a very strong interest in telling you that it's very strong indeed. So on the one hand, the Israelis have an interest in telling us how horrible it is. On the other hand, the Egyptians have an equal interest in telling us how horrible it is. And on the third hand, the Saudis also have an interest in telling us how horrible and dangerous it is, which isn't to say that it isn't horrible and dangerous. It's only to say that I don't really feel like I'm in a very strong position to give you an accurate assessment of that group's strength. It hasn't done some things that it would seem to be pretty obvious if it had the capability to do them, such as attacking the small battalion of US troops that is still stationed in the Sinai. Uh, I doubt very many Americans remember that we still have a battalion of troops stationed in the Sinai, but we do, uh, guaranteeing the Camp David Accord. And it's interesting to me that they haven't yet been hit. Now, you know, there are a variety of reasons for that. But at any event, there's a real group there, and the Egyptians are making a tough go of it. So that's worrisome. But the most worrisome is the Wilayet in Libya. And that is based around uh, Benghazi and Derna in uh, eastern Libya. And here again, if you'd like the historical view of this, you can find it from uh, ISW, which just put out a map showing the origins of foreign fighters coming through the northern Iraq route feeding into Al Qaeda in Iraq in 2006. Um, which we know because we captured a big trove of their documents, and Al-Qaeda has always been pretty meticulous about keeping records. And the largest contingent of those fighters coming in through the north was Libyan. And one of the things that's characteristic of all of the regions I just identified for you is that they were major providers of foreign fighters into Iraq previously. This is a human network that ISIS has had in the past, and it seems now to be pushing back to these groups or to these areas and trying to get something going that will give it a regional stature so that it can contest Al-Qaeda's preeminence on a regional basis and not just in Iraq and Syria. Again, when terrorists compete, we lose. This is not a good thing for us. Um, Libya is, a, is an ungoverned space. The government has collapsed, um, such as it ever was. 
No one has any strategy or approach to dealing with it at all. Uh, the Egyptians are terribly worried about it. It's also destabilizing Morocco. It's feeding into the destabilization of the rest of Africa. Libyan weapons uh, have flowed everywhere because no one protected the arsenals when Gaddafi fell. Uh, so these guys seized them and sent them all over the place, including Iraq, Syria, but also Mali. Um, the French, unfortunately, just to finish off Africa for you, the French, um, when they intervened in Mali, might have been copying the playbook that we used in Afghanistan in 2001, 2002 perfectly, which is unfortunate because it's generated the same effect, namely that we still don't have an effective government or security force in Mali. The French are drawing down, um, and the problem is coming back and has not been in any way solved, and it's destabilizing Mali's neighbors. And that, in turn, has helped feed into the Boko Haram problem. And yes, Boko Haram in Nigeria is also an al-Qaeda affiliate in good standing. And it is growing in strength, um, partly because of generally foolish policies uh, by Nigeria's president, uh, good luck Jonathan, who's more focused on getting himself reelected forever than he is on solving the problem. Um, not that he would have an easy time even if he were trying to do the right thing because it's a pretty, it's a pretty miserable problem. Um, and then that just leaves East, East Africa, which is the only thing that's sort of vaguely resembling anything like a success story at all, is Somalia, which is, it's true, no longer a single country, um, doesn't really have the armed forces necessary to keep the Al-Qaeda group there at bay permanently, um, but nevertheless has degraded it uh, significantly and it doesn't control the territory that it had before. So, uh, what about Sydney? Um, apart from being a terrible tragedy, and I don't know anything more than, than you do if you've been following the news closely, this guy seems to have been a complete whack job. Um, I don't know yet, I haven't, don't have any basis to assess whether he had contact with ISIS or Al-Qaeda or anyone or not. What we do know is that ISIS has been very aggressively calling for precisely this kind of lone wolf attack, including in Australia, um, and that this has been a major emphasis for them. Um, you know, I'm not prepared to stand here the way that the Telegraph immediately labeled it, uh, you know, Islamic State attack. That was way over the top and not justified. I don't know whether there's a relationship, but I do know that we are seeing an increasing number of these kinds of things, although this is the first... Unless we find a tie between this guy and Al-Qaeda or ISIS, uh, this would be the first actual lone wolf attack that we've seen. None of the attacks in the U.S. that are called lone wolf attacks are, in my view, actually lone wolf attacks because all of the perpetrators had direct contact with Al-Qaeda uh, people prior to the attacks. So it's not really what we mean by a lone wolf attack. This one may have been. Um, my fear is that this may be coming soon to a mall near you. Um, there's absolutely nothing hard about doing what he did. And uh, you could do it here in Baltimore, you could do it in Minneapolis. Um, might be a little bit harder in certain parts of Texas that are very well armed. Um, you know, I could make nasty snarks about the Secret Service, but that would be unfair. I think Washington's probably would be pretty hard, hard to do this also. New York would probably be a little bit harder, but probably get away with it. Lots of places in middle America where it would be no trouble at all. And that really worries me, because just to end on what I think the stakes are, because this comes up all the time, how important is this? No, Al-Qaeda is not going to invade the United States and, and enslave us all and convert us to Islam. Um, I'm actually very confident that over the long term we will win this war, and I'm happy to talk with you about that. But I'm afraid for the American way of life. I'm afraid for what it may do to our country. Uh, particularly if we have an extended ter domestic terrorism campaign, or that is say, a, a campaign of terrorism within the U.S. I'm very afraid about the consequences for that, for what America is of any such thing. Happy to talk to you about the NSA thing and Snowden, who is a traitor in my opinion, um, did enormous damage to the United States. Happy to talk with you about all of that stuff, but suffice it to say that if you don't like what was going on under Snowden, wait until we actually have a serious terrorism campaign going on in this country, and I guarantee you that Uncle Sam will be looking at every darn thing you do. And in fact, the people will be demanding it and ready to fire congressmen who oppose it. I'm even more concerned about the future of race relations in this country if we actually got this going. I'm very concerned about how 
Americans would view the Muslim minority in the United States if we had a significant campaign of Islamist terror, which would be quite unfair because the overwhelming vast, 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 vast majority of American Muslims absolutely reject this kind of nonsense. But, you know, this is the country that interned Japanese after Pearl Harbor. And I fear for the future of race relations if we actually have, and race relations of a different variety here, although not entirely because, of course, a significant portion of the American Muslim population is in the prison system and is African American. And that's another concern in every, in every possible way. I don't want to see Americans turning on each other. I don't want to see us sort of riven apart and losing trust in one another, which we shouldn't. But I'm afraid that this kind of campaign can erode all of those ties that bind us together. And that really worries me. Apart from the questions of people getting killed and, and things getting blown up and stuff, which, you know, I actually think that's pretty significant. I think the damage done to the country on 9-11 was significant. I think losing 3,000 innocent people is a big deal. I don't think that's something that we should suddenly say, well, you know, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that big a deal after all. Some people like to, but even apart from that, I just think that if we're concerned about keeping America what it is, we need to be concerned about dealing with this problem. And that means that we need to think about what the problem is in the first instance, and that's what I've tried to do. So I'll stop there and be happy to take your questions. Thanks. Sir. So the question is, um, <clears throat> basically, are military interventions uh, increasing the problem by recruiting more uh, young Muslims to the cause who then would otherwise be? And is there a way for us to solve that? Is there a way for us to make our interventions more effective so that they don't generate that problem? Um, this is obviously a very live issue. And I would, say, uh, I would say it's not a question of when, as our interventions are more successful, we alienate more. Actually, as our interventions are more successful, we alienate fewer. Because in order to be successful, you actually have to proceed in a way that is less alienating. Um, I you know, we learned this lesson and unlearned it, um, unfortunately. When you go in really heavy with a lot of firepower, and you kick down a lot of doors, and you drop a lot of tons of ordnance on things, you can kill a lot of people, although it actually turns out to be pretty hard to kill the individuals that you're trying to kill even with all of our technology. But you also piss off a lot of people. And you make a lot of people very angry and you destroy a lot of infra infrastructure that people rely on. And you make a lot of enemies. And it's actually a very ineffective way. It's a superficially efficient way of fighting, but it's a very ineffective way of found it counterproductive. So we learned that lesson in Iraq and then in Afghanistan. Um, and that was actually part of what the change in strategy around the surge was. It brought a lot more violence initially because we went into areas that the enemy had been controlling. But the focus was much more on actually establishing contact with the people and understanding why, if they were supporting al-Qaeda, why they were supporting al-Qaeda. If they weren't, what we could do to help them fight against it. And we forged a number of alliances in Iraq and then also in Afghanistan to fight against these guys. That didn't create more recruits. That dried up the pool of recruits for al-Qaeda in these areas. And you can ask the US aid administrator what he thinks was effective and what wasn't. There are things that aid did that were tremendously effective and that our military valued enormously and regarded as an integral part of a counterinsurgency strategy. Because if you just go in and shoot stuff up, then yeah, you can aggravate people. If you shoot things up in a, very, in a more controlled way, if you take out bad guys, and then you come and you bring something to people, then you have an opportunity to persuade them, no, we're actually not here to rape your country. We're actually not here to kill you all. We actually are here to fight the bad guys who are pressing you too. And we managed to bring a lot of people on side that way. Unfortunately, we've unlearned that lesson. And we've unlearned it because of our fixation with saying no ground troops. We're not going to put ground troops anywhere. So here's the problem. When you have a soldier on the ground, a soldier can talk to people. The soldier can play soccer with children. You wouldn't believe how much that actually matters. The soldier can ask people, is this a bad guy? Is that a bad guy? And figure out who the bad guy actually is, not just take everybody's word for it, because <laughs> guess what? Then you get told that everybody's a bad guy. Um, a soldier can enter, or a Marine, any, any human being can interact with human beings. If you go in with an aircraft, it doesn't matter whether it's a drone or not and you're interacting with a population via a 500-pound bomb, you don't have those conversations. 
All you're doing is blowing stuff up and killing people. And you don't control the narrative of who got killed either. And this is the other problem that we have repeatedly in Yemen, because inevitably we kill 500 school children every time we drop one of these things. Okay, no, we don't. Actually, our weapons are incredibly precise and we're extremely careful about applying them. I suspect that the numbers of actual collateral deaths are very, very small, especially in recent strikes. Nevertheless, every time we do it, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has local villagers run out and explain that we just blew up a school. So the problem with delivering our message from standoff air power is that it is counterproductive in this way. And the other problem with it is that it does nothing to bring the majority of people in these countries who agree with us and disagree with Al-Qaeda onto our side. Because it doesn't protect them. Because you need to keep something in mind. There are two ways that a terrorist organization can get support. One is people can support it, people can believe in it, and in some places they do. And that's, you have to think about what your solutions are to that kind of problem. But the, the thing about being a terrorist organization is that you are a terrorist organization. You can terrorize people. And they do this to local populations. So local populations that initially welcome them for whatever reason, then discover what creeps they are, try to throw them out, and then the terror fangs come out. If we do nothing to protect the locals, they will passively support because the alternative is getting dead very painfully. And we're not protecting them with this drone campaign. So unfortunately, we've created an incentive structure here that puts us at our worst vis-a-vis -vis the local population, all in the name of not creating more jihadis by, with the theory that if, we do, you know, if we're not occupying people's countries, then we won't be creating more jihadis. So we have it kind of backwards, which is not to say that I want to put American troops everywhere. Let me just be very clear about that. I don't. Uh, it is to say that we need to get past this mantra of no ground troops and think more seriously about what would be appropriate in each case. Sir. Uh, so the question is, what is the role of Turkey um, in stopping the rise of ISIS, given that it has a common border with Syria? <coughs> um, yes, uh, Turkey could have been very helpful in fighting ISIS. Um, is pretty determined to fight ISIS, although unfortunately not al-Qaeda generally, uh, which is a bit of a problem. Um, but Turkey is less interested in fighting ISIS than it is in fighting Assad. And the problem that we have with Turkey is that because we refused ever to take a very strong position on going after Assad, the Turks have not been very interested in doing what we want them to do. And just to make a larger point, which you know shouldn't be news to most people, but seems to be news to a lot of policymakers, in the world that we live in, when you're trying to get people to do things that subserve your interests, you generally have to give them things that subserve theirs. That's diplomacy. I taught this, you know. I mean, I could, get, I could even get cadets to understand this. <laughs> All right, you'd think that the occasional congressman could get it too, or president. But you, if you go to someone and say, I want you to do this, and they say, okay, well, you know, we, we'll think about doing that, but, but we want your help in doing why, and we say no. And then we look at them a few weeks later and say, how come you're not doing what we asked you to do? And they say, and they say what's hard about this? That's, the pro that's one of the big problems we have with Turkey. And it's one of the big problems that we have generally with all of our regional alliances. Because we refuse to think about what we have to do for them. And our line is very much exactly what they think it is. And this is the funny thing. When you talk to them, this is what they say. You Americans think that we have to do what you want because we're here and we're facing this problem. And therefore, you think you don't have to give us anything to do it, which is exactly the way we think. The problem is it's wrong. Yes, they are there facing the problem, but they're facing a number of other problems too. And they don't have to solve the problem in the way that we would like them to. And that's something that we need to be very concerned about. The Saudis have a solution to the Yemen problem at this point. It's called a very big wall. That's what they're doing. They are, build, they are depopulating about 20 mile stretch along their border with Yemen, which is mostly through open desert, and building a big wall. And I wish them luck with that because, you know, as we all know, walls and fences are terrifically effective at keeping people out. Um, and I'm sure that, that Saudi border guards will be much more alert uh, than uh, anyway. Um, that's not a solution that helps us. That doesn't help us at all. But if we want to tell the Saudis, would you please go in and help the Yemenis defeat AQAP, they're going to say, well, we need to talk about some stuff. 
what do they want to talk about? And here's where the Iran thing comes in. They want to talk about why are you prepared to give the store away to Iran? Why are you coming to ask us, the Saudis and the Gulf Arabs in general, to fight your fight against ISIS when you're selling us down the drain with the enemy that we actually regard as existential? So they look at us and they look at the nuclear deal and say, we're selling them out. We're trying to flip our regional alliances. We're trying to align with Iran against them. That's the way they see it. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. That's the way they see it. And then we're saying, and by the way, would you do a whole bunch of nasty stuff against groups that aren't actually targeting you at the moment? Because we would really like that. The question is, is a rapprochement with Iran possible? And if it were possible, would it be a good idea to try to get them to be allies against ISIS? Um, I need to set aside the question of whether a rapprochement with Iran is possible. A rapprochement with this regime in Iran is not possible. Um, and that is something that this regime makes very clear on a daily basis. Um, and it's very obvious from the study of the nature of this regime. The, the regime that Ayatollah Khomeini founded uh, knit together a number of different ideologies, and it was rather a remarkable uh, accomplishment that he did that. There was the core Shia Islamist view that he um, sort of founded and, and described, but that was only part of it. Um, there was also from the outset a profound anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, although they, they cloaked it as anti-Zionism, um, that drove the regime and which is at the heart of that regime's founding. But there was also a profound anti-Americanism. And that's part of the defining characteristic of that regime. America as the inheritor of the British tradition of colonialism in the Middle East is very much central to the Iranian regime's self-conception. And being the resistance to that permeates their, all of their language. This supreme leader is, if anything, even more uh, vitriolically anti-American than Khomeini was. Um, he has made it his sort of core issue to be anti-American. And the Iranian regime is at pains to reassure its people, by which I think really we mean reassure its core supporters, that under no circumstances does the nuclear talks presage any kind of rapprochement. That this is entirely compartmentalized, that they refuse to talk to us about anything else. Under no circumstances will they talk to us about anything else. And in fact, they, they continue to pare down even the range of uh, nuclear-related issues that they'll talk about. So there is absolutely no interest or willingness on the Iranian side, on the Iranian regime side, to um, have any kind of rapprochement with us. Um, and honestly, as I, you know, as I watch this administration continue to reach out with letters and various other things, uh, what comes to mind is he's just not that into you. Um, you know. President Obama has reached out much more than it was, in my opinion, reasonable to reach out. And Khamenei has flipped him the Persian bird every time. Um, and, there's, and that's not going to change, whether we get a nuclear deal or not. But I, I want to make a larger point about this, because I, I want to answer the second part of the question, even having answered the first one negatively. No, it would not be a good idea, even if we could do it. Because the Iranian regime, as it is now, is one of the principal drivers of sectarian violence in the Middle East. Their end state for Iraq is very different from our end state. They are anti-ISIS, but you know what they say about ISIS? They say it's our creation. Constantly. Senior leadership at every level. We created ISIS and we are behaving in a hip, absolutely ludicrously hypocritical fashion now by pretending that we are somehow fighting this thing which was our own creation and all of it is simply cover for reestablishing an American military footprint in Iraq and the region from which to attack Iran. That's their narrative. And it's unanimous, I mean it's universal. You won't find anyone really arguing against that. Do they really believe it? I don't know. As, as Frank pointed out, my background is in Sovietology and I spend a lot of time arguing about do people really believe their ideologies. I've been in Washington long enough to know that, you know, if you spend a lot of time telling yourself something, at a certain point, unless you're a remarkable person, you kind of start believing it. Um, even if you didn't to begin with, which I think is unlikely. But they support the most radical sectarian groups in Iraq that are even now engaged in sectarian cleansing that makes the Sunni population in Iraq feel as if it is being deliberately targeted, which it is, 
and creates the most fertile possible ground for Al-Qaeda to come in and say, we are the defenders of the Sunni community. So unfortunately, even if we could get all the way around and, and do the Persian rapprochement, they only know how to make things worse. They think they, they're very arrogant about their ability to operate in the region, but they only know how to make things worse too. So no, it wouldn't be a good idea. The question was, shouldn't, the, shouldn't Muslim clerics uh, be speaking out against uh, the ISIS ideology because uh, it is, after all, a religious ideology? Yes, um, they should. And some of them, or many of them, actually are. Um, <clears throat> more could. I've seen some very effective examples of this. When, when we were in Afghanistan, um, one of the most effective things we heard about was a small team of I'm going to call them special operators from Jordan, who were in fact de-radicalizing imams. And they had a really outsized influence in Afghanistan because Afghanistan is a very poor, rural, generally illiterate population. And these Jordanians were Hashemites. And to the Afghans, that was a really big deal. And so we would bring in a de-radicalizing cleric and do a lot of protection for him because the Taliban, needless to say, didn't approve of this. Um, and we would get crowds of two, three, four hundred people showing up, including the local Taliban guys, who would come there to, to swap arguments with these people and get crushed, needless to say, because the Talibs actually didn't generally know their Quran all that well. And they'd been taught a bunch of stuff that was lousy. How effective was it? I don't know. It mattered. At the end of the day, one of the reasons I'm confident that we will prevail in this conflict is because I'm confident that the overwhelming majority of the Sunni population will reject what is in fact a heresy within the religion that goes back to the foundation of the religion that reemerges periodically, gener generationally, and is defeated every time because it is in fact a heresy. I'm really pretty confident that that's going to happen. I'm eager to find ways of making it happen faster. One of the interesting things about Sunni Islam is that you, you encounter often a sort of a mandate of heaven phenomenon um, in terms of religious justification. In Sunni Islam, generally, if you're doing well, if you're claiming to be righteous and you're doing well in the world, the community is more likely to see that as a sign of Allah's blessing and a sign that you are, in fact, righteous. If you're doing badly, the community is more likely to see that as a sign that Allah has withdrawn his favor from you. That's not true in Shiism which is a martyrdom faith where worldly success does not correlate to uh, divine support necessarily. But in Sunnism, it really does. And so it tends, that phenomenon tends to create really nonlinear effects as these groups increase in strength and as they rapidly collapse. So right now, we've been seeing a, an increase in strength in ISIS and Al-Qaeda that's been very rapid as they've had a lot of success. But in 2007, we saw a rapid collapse of these guys as we made it clear that they were going to lose. So there are multiple things that you can do to deal with a religious problem. Having clerics speak against it is very important. Preventing these guys from being successful is in many respects even more important um, because Sunnism is a very decentralized religion and they've got their imams, we've got our imams, we can all argue about whose imams are right. But the community at the end of the day is more likely to look at who's winning. And so it's very important that they not be. And unfortunately, right now they are. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question with a certain amount of historical um, digression was, um, should we be involved in the region or should we, and by what right are we involved in the region? Is it our interest to be involved in the region or should we uh, leave it be and, and try to protect ourselves here and raise our own young people properly? Which I think is a very valid and important question. Um, I'm not going to get into the question of whether we invaded Iraq in 2003 because of oil. No, we didn't. Um, we can, you can argue about that if you want to. Uh, I don't think we did. I don't think the analogies to ancient Rome hold. We're not an empire. Um, and I'm happy to go down the, the historical and political science literature on that subject with you, and we could argue about it all evening. Um, we're not an empire. If we were, it would actually be a lot easier to deal with this stuff. Um, no, I'm actually serious about that. The cool thing about being an empire is that when you conquer something, you then govern it. You set up your own dudes and you say you're running it and you give them an army and you schwack people when they get out of line and it's, you know, we can say the Rome fell but it fell like 1500 years after it was founded. That's a pretty good run. Um, the British Empire also fell. It also had a pretty good run. It's a lot easier to do that kind of thing actually than it is to do what we do, which is to intervene with the objective of leaving and leaving behind something that can be a stable government 
that is responsive to its people in some way, because that accords with our values and with our understanding of what stability and in our interests are. That's actually a lot harder. I think it's worth it. Not only does it accord with our values, this is not an imperial time. And I don't think that imperialism would be successful. But let me say, mainly it doesn't accord with our values. So we have a harder row to hoe. Now the question is, do we have to hoe it? And I think that that's a very reasonable question. The problem is that, going back to the points I was making at the beginning, yes, can we, can we stand back and be Fortress America? This, let me just tell you what I think would be involved in doing that, and you can decide for yourself um, whether you, you know, how you want to make the trade-off. I think that's the fairest way to do it. If we're going to be for, uh, Fortress America, then we're not going to have a forward presence, uh, which means we're not going to have a whole lot of intelligence assets, which means we're not fundamentally going to see a lot of these plots as they evolve, and we're basically going to say that we're going to give the enemy uh, f free reign to wind up and swing at us whenever they want to, and we're going to bet that we will always stop them, or that we'll stop them a high enough percentage of the time. What does stopping them mean? It means that our border security is going to have to be orders of magnitude more ferocious than it actually is. We're going to have to turn a lot of people away. We're going to have to be extremely intrusive um, for people that we do admit. Um, but it also means that we're going to have to give our police enormous policing powers, and we're going to have to give our intelligence agencies enormous um, policing powers also within the United States. Because if you are relying on stopping them before they pull the trigger rather than identifying the plots when they're out somewhere else disrupting them and so forth, um, then the burden on your intelligence services and your policing of your own people becomes much greater. So unfortunately, in my view, trying to be Fortress America will lead to becoming much more of a police state and really changing what we are as Americans. Now there's a very legitimate challenge that you can throw right back, me, back at me, and since this was the last question, I'm gonna do it for you. <laughs> and the challenge is, aren't we heading there anyway because we're dealing with a radicalizing population where we're gonna have this problem? To which my answer is basically, I don't no, I don't think so. Um, and I think that there is a big difference between the, you know, lone wolf attacks, which can do a lot of damage to our society, and the kind of really organized, trained, planned, um, and supported campaigns of sustained violence that you would see if we actually allowed these groups uh, free reign to establish safe havens and take all the swings they want at us. It would be a different order of magnitude of threat, and it would bring forth from us a different order of magnitude of response. So we do have a very serious problem now. We do have increasing radicalization, we are going to see lone wolf attacks, and we are going to have to think hard about how we're going to deal with that as a nation. Um, but I think it's important not to pour gasoline on that fire uh, by giving, by allowing these groups to have uh, maximum freedom to plan, prepare, uh, and conduct all of these attacks as they want. And on that happy note, uh, I will turn it back to...